Hello, everyone. Yep, hold on one sec. That should work, sorry about that. And welcome to the 2021 Central PA Playwriting Fest readings. Today we've been celebrating the power of words, the power of new works, and all of the playwrights who've created these wonderful works, these wonderful words, the dialogue, the plots, and the lovely characters that go with them. Our last reading for the day is Serving the Story by Scott Gibson. And there were three one acts selected from 41 total submitted. And out of our shorts, of which were 105, six were submitted for readings today. We're sort of doing the Zoom version of a table read, as everybody's out there is used to by now. And after the reading, we'll have a Q&A with the playwright or a talk with the playwright. So let's learn a little bit about Scott. Scott Gibson is a Colorado native and the author of somewhere in the vicinity of 70 plays, a few of which have been published, a few more have been produced, and a great many more have never seen the light of day. He was the co-recipient of the Stephen Dites Original Playwriting Award for his full-length play, Someone Else's Life, in 2006, and his play, Crosswords, was the winner of both Chameleon Circle Theater's Original Play Competition in St. Paul, Minneapolis, and winner of Vintage Theater's Mystery Thriller Playwriting Competition in Denver, Colorado. His short piece, The Restaurant Play, is slated to be streamed at Road Theater in North Hollywood this coming August. Serving the story. At rise, Sterling, a debonair man, 30s, sits in a chair, stroking his chin thoughtfully. Magenta, mid 30s, all hair and attitude, paces restlessly. This continues for a few seconds. Stop it. Stop the pacing. I can't help it. Of course you can help it, just quit putting one foot in front of the other. How can you just sit there like that? I don't know. How would you like me to sit? Don't do that. Don't be clever. And there you go again. I hate this. This feeling of being trapped, being at the mercy of someone else's whims, their mood their motivation or lack thereof. Sit down. There's only one chair. Sterling stands and gestures to the seat that he's just vacated. Rupert, a thoroughly undistinguished stagehand, enters carrying another chair. He crosses past both Sterling and Magenta and positions the chair. He turns and exits. Sterling and Magenta study the new chair. Or that. How long is this going to go on? How long are we expected to just wait? You've been here as long as I have. You know as much as I do. That isn't an answer. I thought you were being rhetorical. Feels as if it's been a long time. Weeks. You, like that. Me, like this. You look beautiful. I look like someone out of one of those daytime dramas. I hope it's not that. I want a drink, something strong. That's something someone in a daytime drama would say. I don't care, I would like to have. Rupert re-enters carrying two cocktail glasses. He hands one to Sterling, then crosses to offer the other to Magenta. Rupert turns and starts to leave. Wait. He crosses back and hands her the other glass. I didn't really want it. I just needed something to do with my hands. Sterling sips from his glass and Magenta swirls the ice cubes in hers, but does not drink. You should sit back down. That counts, not yet. Why not? I'm described as debonair. I would never sit while a lady is still standing. You were standing before. Sterling and Magenta turn to look at Iris, an audience member seated in the front row. I know, but now that I'm standing, I can't sit until you do. 
I don't want to sit. That's fine. I'll continue to stand. Sterling takes another sip from his glass. Magenta turns and crosses upstage as if looking out a window. This, however, is a bare stage apart from the two chairs, so she's really only looking at the upstage wall. Sterling? Yes, Magenta? Your name is Sterling. I... I think so, yes. And yours is Magenta. Crap. This isn't good. N now, you don't know that. Don't I? Not for sure. Real people aren't named Magenta. Maybe one or two are named Sterling, but no Magentas. Magenta takes a couple of steps down and points to Iris. You. Me? What's your name? Um, Iris. You see, Iris, that's a real person with a real person's name. It tells you what we're working with here, doesn't it? This isn't Tolstoy or Chekhov or Ibsen, where women are named Anya or Nora or Olga. Believable, nice names. Well, what about Blanche Dubois? It doesn't get much more theatrical than that. You don't think that didn't raise a, a few eyebrows when she went to the driver's license bureau? That's Tennessee Williams. He's allowed. We are not working with that caliber of talent here. No, you see someone named Magenta and you already have a pretty good idea what she's about. She's sleeping with her best friend's husband. She's gotten her mother committed to a psychiatric hospital in order to get her hands on her money. She's probably the evil twin masquerading as the good one for some nefarious reason. Oh God, I just the word nefarious. You see, we're in a soap opera or a really bad romance novel. Any minute now, they're going to tear open your shirt. Why would I do that? Because you won't be able to help yourself. It's just what people like us do. This is a really nice shirt. Can I just unbutton it carefully? There's no dramatic tension in that. No, sooner or later, it's going to get torn open. Rupert enters, crosses to Sterling, raises his hands, preparing to rip open Sterling's shirt. Sterling pushes Rupert's hands away and crosses his arms over his chest protectively. Get away from me! Rupert shrugs and exits. Sterling smooths the front of his shirt. You're only postponing the inevitable. Just because you've decided that we're in some kind of romantic potboiler doesn't automatically make it so. This could be something much deeper, more thoughtful than that. Brian, an audience member sitting somewhere else in the front row, joins in. I hope not. I was hoping for something funny. Sometimes you just need a distraction, something to take your mind off what's happening in your real life. I don't need to watch or read about somebody else's problems. I got plenty of my own. I feel so uh, closed in. I, I just want to get out of here. Take a drive or a walk along the bluffs, breathing in the sea air. Are there bluffs? And is there a sea? There must be. Why else would I have said that? Magenta moves dramatically up to the upstage wall once more. She appears to be gazing out at something. Oh, uh, what is it? What do you see? I... Yes? Just for a moment. Yes? I thought I caught a glimpse of... What? What's out there? Nothing. There's nothing. Can't you tell? With a flourish, Magenta turns away. She crosses down and throws herself into one of the chairs. Sterling crosses up another step or two to stare at the same spot on the wall that Magenta was looking at. It's a wall. You're looking at a wall. Look... <laughs> I'm sorry, but you really need to keep quiet. You're not part of this. We're not even supposed to know you're out there. Then why are you talking to her? Because she, and you, you need to keep butting in. That's not what's supposed to happen. We, we're trying to tell a story here. Are we struggling? Are we really? We're floundering is what we're doing. Marking time, waiting for the author to come back from wherever he's been, from whatever's been distancing him, uh, to sit down and start typing again. Yet for all we know, he's forgotten about us entirely, or he's suffering from writer's block. 
or he's moved on to something else entirely. Don't, don't be absurd. Don't even think about that. It's terrifying, isn't it? To realize you're nothing but a construct? Something somebody else dreamt up. Stop it. You're talking surrealistic nonsense. You and I were, were just as real uh, as, uh, as, uh, as them. Are we? Then answer me this. Where did you come from? What? Where did you come from? Before this room, where were you? Uh, I... Where were you born? Where are your parents? Where did you go to school? Stop it. Where did you get the clothes you have on? Did you buy them? Pick them out? Shut up. How did you get here today? Did you drive? Do you know? Stop talking! How do we know each other? Am I your wife? Your girlfriend? Your shut sister? up! Just shut up, damn you! You... Uh, you're my... Mistress. I'm betting she's your mistress. No. Wife. Ex-wife. Yeah, that's it. That's good. That's good. See? Anybody's guest. So we're just characters, then. Somebody's characters. I'm afraid so. Entirely at the mercy of someone else's imagination. With absolutely no control over our own destiny. No, oh, boo-hoo. Excuse me. Poor you. You think you've got it so bad? Well, welcome to life. Now, wait a minute. You can't just walk into the middle of our story like this. What's your big lament? You don't know where you're going. It feels like somebody else is calling the shots. You think you're the only ones that feel that way? You think we don't all sometimes feel like somebody else is writing our lives for us, even though we're the ones trying to actually live it? Because if that's what you think is just you, then I've got a newsflash. Rupert enters carrying another cocktail glass. He gives it to Iris. Oh, wasn't this nice? Thank you. Thank you. Rupert turns and exits. Look, we're all in the same boat. We may think we're the captain, the one doing the steering, but not really. We get to make the little choices, but at any given time, there are forces beyond our control. Whether it's you or any of us real people, we're all just standing around waiting to see what our author has in store for us. Now, wait a minute. I resent that implication. Being fictional doesn't make me any less real. I'm right here. Of course you are. But you're missing my point. We're all operating within a, within a set of boundaries, limitations. It's up to each of us to find a way to make it work or be miserably unhappy otherwise. Oh dear. What? <sighs> miserably unhappy. That's redundant. Is there any other misery besides the unhappy kind? This is not good writing. Brian stands and begins walking up the aisle to leave. Excuse me. Excuse me. What are you doing? Leaving. What does it look like? Look, I came in here hoping for something light, fun, not existential angst about who's really here or not. But knock yourselves out. Brian exits. Well, that was rude. Maybe. But you have to admire him. He was discontented where he was. So he opted to change that. But what if he gives other people ideas? What if other people get up and leave? What if he does? What if they do? Do you really want a bunch of people sitting out there watching you if they aren't really enjoying it? Yes. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Magenta. Maggie. Oh, do you mind if I call you Maggie? I don't. No. Well, it's just so much less formal. And, and now that I've gotten to know you, you seem more like a Maggie than a Magenta. It is a trashy name, just like you said. I don't know what he was thinking. What who was thinking? Let's sit down. You too, Sterling. I can't. There aren't enough chairs. Uh... Rupert enters, carrying another chair, which he sets directly behind Sterling. Oh. Thank you, Rupert. Rupert waves at Iris over his shoulder as he exits. Rupert. 
That's his name? How, how did you know that? He just looks like a Rupert. None of this makes any sense. But at least something is finally happening. We're not just two people stuck in a room, unable to do anything or go anywhere. Something new has been introduced. Yes, now we're three people stuck in a room. Brian enters from the wings. Or four. What the hell? How did I? I'm just trying to find the way out of here. Brian exits. <laughs> You've got to stop letting your limitations define you, Maggie. You're too sterling. Maggie, just a minute ago, you crossed upstage. You looked out an imaginary window, and for a split second, you almost saw something. Remember? No. No, I, I don't. Think. Think. You talked about bluffs and an ocean. Is that what you saw? No, I, I don't think so. Iris crosses up to the spot where Magenta had been standing and gazing before. Don't you understand? It was a real moment. And in those few seconds, we could almost see it too. Make us see it, Maggie. Make it come to life for us. I can't. I can't. Okay, I see. You just want to go on being a magenta for the rest of your life, all heaving bosoms, sultry looks, and torn open shirts. Iris turns to Sterling, and before he can react, she grasps the front of his shirt in both hands and tears it open. Hey! I was just making a point. And besides, we all knew it was coming, right? There was foreshadowing. Now, you can just relax and stop wondering when. Sit. Did anyone... Did anyone see where the buttons went? And and it's fine if you want to be a magenta. Personally, I, I happen to love daytime dramas and romance novels. So do a lot of people. And we all know the bad girls are the most interesting characters. Whatever you want to be, wherever you want to go, just have to own it. Brian enters again. <laughs> oh, for God's sake, how does anybody ever find their way out of here? It's just a maze of corridors and dressing rooms back there. I couldn't even find a bathroom. And I'd really like to pee before I go. It's a long drive home. I'm starting to think you don't really want to leave. Watch me. Brian crosses to exit. But just as he reaches the left side of the stage, Rupert appears, carrying another chair, blocking his way. The two men stare at each other. Excuse me, I'm just trying to get around you. I need to get out of here. Rupert sets the chair down hard and does not take his gaze off of Brian. Did you hear me? I just want to leave. That's all. I need to sit. No, I'm not part of this. I was out there before. I was part of the audience. I said, sit. Rupert picks up the chair and carries it a few steps. He positions it just left of where Magenta is sitting. He looks back at Brian, who has not moved. Rupert gestures vigorously to the seat of the chair, indicated Brian is to sit there. A direction here says Brian sits. Are you Brian? Yes. Then sit. Brian hesitates only a second or so before crossing and sitting in the chair next to Magenta. Once Rupert is satisfied that Brian is in the chair, he turns and exits. I don't think there's supposed to be a Brian in this story. Not this Brian, anyway. There is now. But I don't know the first thing about acting. That hasn't stopped a lot of people that I've worked with. At least you're willing to admit it. Does anybody have a safety pin or something? Wait, I'm starting to remember. Magenta crosses up to the wall where she was standing before. It was... Come on, take your time, focus. It was scenery. Of course it was scenery. What else are you, are you going to see when you look out a window? No, but it was moving. <sighs> moving? Rushing past us. Slowly at first and then faster. How can that be? As if we were. Oh! 
Oh, of course, <laughs> we're on a train. The scenery isn't moving, we are. Get up, get up. Help me move these seats. We need to make a passenger coach. We're making a row. Line up your chairs behind mine. Come on, come on. Sterling, Iris, and Brian all pick up their chairs and place them single file behind Magenta's. Rupert enters carrying a fifth chair, which he places last in line. Everyone sits in their chairs, Magenta in the first chair, Brian in the second, Iris in the third, Sterling in the fourth, and Rupert in the fifth. They all bob up and down slightly, mimicking the motion of riding in a moving train, accompanied by the sound effect of train chugging. What now? I'm, I'm not sure. Look out the windows. What are you doing here? Whoever heard of a train with just four people on it? I'm another passenger. We're not all traveling by ourselves, are we? Shouldn't some of us be sitting in the same row? You're right. Move your chair up next to mine. Look who's suddenly an expert on staging a play, Mr. I don't know anything about acting. It's chilly in here. I wish I'd brought a coat. These old train coaches were never very warm, especially traveling through the mountains in winter. Um, okay, so that's what we're doing and where we are? I guess so. It seemed like the thing to say anyway. Okay, I'm confused. Is this a period piece or are we modern day people traveling aboard an old train for some reason? Oh, I just realized something. What, what is it? Look, we're coming to a tunnel. The stage is plunged into darkness for several seconds. The sound of a train whistle is heard. You know what always seems to happen on old trains like these, don't you? No, what? The lights come up. Everyone is still in their seat, except for Rupert, who is stretched out face down on the floor. <gasps> Good Lord. This man has been murdered. But how? Stabbed. Viciously stabbed. I knew it. You're just asking for trouble when you ride an old-fashioned train through the mountains in the winter. Anybody who's read Agatha Christie knows that. Who could have done this? Isn't it obvious? It was one of us under the cover of momentary darkness. Rupert shifts uncomfortably. He slides one arm under his body and retrieves a small object, which he awkwardly hands to Sterling. I think this belongs to you. Oh, one of my buttons, thank you. Uh, I don't suppose you have to happen a needle and thread on you, okay. Rupert collapses again. You had the chance to ask him one question, like maybe who stabbed you? Instead, you ask him for a needle and thread? Yeah, well, let's see how you, how clearly you think when you've just discovered a dead body. I did just discover a dead body. We all did. You know, for someone who didn't even want to be up here, you certainly have a lot of suggestions. Ask the dead guy a better question. Hey, Magenta, mind if I slide my chair up next to yours? That's not what I said, and you know it. I was just trying to go for a little authenticity. Oh, authenticity, my ass. You figured if you were stuck here with the rest of us, you might as well hit on the leading lady. I wasn't hitting on her. And even if I was, what's it to you? <laughs> I knew it. I knew it, you little lech. Well, it wasn't like you were making a move. How long have we all been sitting out there waiting for something, anything to happen? You had your chance, dude, and you blew it. I figured she was fair game at this point. Fair game. Dude, who are you calling dude? Sterling presses his hands against Brian's shoulders, shoving him back a step. You? That's who I'm calling dude. Or would you prefer I call you debonair? Brian plants his hands on Sterling's shoulders and shoves him back a step as well. I am nobody's fair game. I just want you to know that. You little mealy-mouthed amateur. You're damn straight I'm debonair, something you'll never be. Sterling shoves Brian a bit harder. Nor what I want to be. As far as I can tell, debonair is just French for I have a stick up my butt. Brian shoves Sterling again. Touch me again and you're going to regret it. Yeah? What are you going to do about it? Sterling shoves Brian once more. This and this. Sterling shoves Brian. Now they are shoving each other back and forth. Jerk. Creep. Oh, stop it. Stop it, you two. 
Brian plants his hands on Sterling's shoulders to shove him again. Sterling places his hands atop Brian's. The two men pause, staring at each other. Iris and Magenta watch, spellbound. Even Rupert raises up from the floor to watch them. <clears throat> there is an electricity between Sterling and Brian now. They lean in toward each other. Sterling puts one hand on the upstage side of Brian's face. Their faces are mere inches apart. Just when it appears a kiss is imminent, Brian averts his face. Um, I'm not comfortable with where this is going. Uh, yeah. Neither. <clears throat> and Hold Rupert on. gets to his feet. Hold on. Rupert exits. The others watch him go. Sterling and Brian remove their hands from each other, glance awkwardly, and then take a step or two in opposite directions. Sterling again attempts without success to close the front of his torn shirt. Now that is a really pretty dress, by the way. It's what's described in the stage directions, but thank you. Another few seconds pass, then Rupert enters again, flipping through the pages of a script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't been on script since right after we came out of the tunnel. In fact... Rupert stops flipping through the pages. He runs his fingers down one of the pages, shakes his head, flips back and forth through the pages, then just tosses the script over his shoulder. I give up. What do you mean you give up? Just what I said. I give up. Rupert crosses upstage and retrieves the chair he was sitting in earlier. He brings it downstage, plops down in it. I'm done. It isn't worth it. Get yourself another stage manager. Rupert. Magenta crosses and retrieves her chair. She brings it downstage and sits next to Rupert. You can't quit now. How are we supposed to go on without you? We need you. You need me? Of course we do. Do you realize that tonight is the first time you ever called me by my name? Heck, tonight is the first time you've ever even spoken to me at all. Oh, that can't be right. This is the rehearsal. Every night you come breezing in here, sailing right past me with your phone and your latte. <clears throat> Some nights I even had the, I even held the door for you. Not only did, not only don't you say thank you, you don't even toss me a glance. I think. You, I, I think you think that door just opens by itself. Iris has crossed and picked up the script that Rupert tossed aside. She's leafing through the pages. Rupert, Ruby, I'm so sorry. If, if we're done here, could somebody please show me the way out? I talk to you, Rupert. I never take you for granted. We talk every night. We're buds. Buds. <laughs> Right. <laughs> hey, bud. <laughs> One of the light bulbs over over my mirror is burnt out. Another, would you? Bud, get pal and bring me a bottle of water. Yo, bud, my waste paper basket needs emptying. Just using the term doesn't make us buds or pals or compadres or amigos. Rupert's line continues without hesitation, but now Iris reading a page in the script is saying his line with him. Or any of the terms you use when you want something. All of the others, including Rupert, turn to stare at Iris. She looks up from the script. That's right here in the script, Rupert's line. Iris looks down at the script again. She reads the next few lines from the script in unison with the others. What? Stop it. Stop saying everything we're saying. It's here. It's all of that is here. Oh, wait, even when I just told you to stop saying everything we're saying, that's in there too. I don't think Rupert is the stage manager. He's just another character in whatever we're doing here. You too, Brian. What? No. That That's impossible. <laughs> no. No, I, I came with them. I'm one of them. I have a life. I have a job, an apartment, a dog. His name is Buster. He's a golden retriever. Uh, my car is parked in the parking lot outside. I'm sorry. That's all just backstory. 
What is? What's backstory? Everything you just said. It isn't real. Of course it's real. What are you talking about? It's a thing actors do. It's the way some of them build their character by giving them a history to make their performance seem more authentic, more fleshed out. They come up with all kinds of details, things the audience is never going to know about them. But it's a way of inhabiting their character more fully, like deciding what they do for a living. Where they grew up, how many siblings they have. Or if they have a dog. I do, I do have a dog, Buster. He's good, he's really committed to this. Method actor. No, I can show you. I have pictures of him on my phone, just Brian give Pat me a minute. Brian pats his pockets frantically, searching for his phone. He is unable to produce it. Uh, uh, I can't do this. It's just too sad. I can't. I can't find my phone. Maybe your character doesn't have one. Check the prop list at the back of the script. No, 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 no. Nobody is looking at the script anymore. Iris crosses and throws the script off stage. Why did you do that? It isn't healthy. We can't just be relying on that to show us what's coming. All I have to do is walk off stage left, pick it up, and bring it back. I don't think you can. Magenta stands. She crosses, but she slows and then stops just before exiting. She seems to be having some sort of internal struggle, clenching and unclenching her hands at her sides. Finally, she turns back to the others. Okay, you're right, but Rupert can. Rupert? Please go and pick up the script. I don't think I can either. I could when I thought I was the stage manager. Even if I could, I don't want to. But then what are we supposed to do now? Well, why don't we go back to where you had us before? On the train? I guess at least we seem to have a purpose then. Magenta and Rupert move their chairs back upstage to reform the train seats again. Rupert lies face down on the floor where he was before. Sterling kneels beside him and the others resume their positions around them. Okay, I'm still confused. If I'm not me, am I a character or am I an actor playing a character? Well, if we think about that too much, we're never going to get anything done. Right, so let's just go. Where were we? Um, okay, uh, give me my cue line. Your what? My cue line, say, who could have done this? Oh, who could have done this? Isn't it obvious? It was one of us under the cover of, oh, hold on. What now? It was one of it. It is one of us. I mean, what are you talking about? Sterling stands, crosses several steps away from the others. They all watch him, including Rupert, who has raised himself up from the floor. It's the only explanation. The only reason we could have gone so far off course. What's he doing? One of us is responsible for this train wreck, and, and I'm not talking about the one we're pretending to be riding on. I mean, I mean this. One of us is the author. What? Don't you see? One of us is not who he or she is pretending to be. I thought none of us are who we're pretending to be. Isn't that what you said a little while ago? We're each playing a part? Most of us are, but one. One of us is actually orchestrating things. One of us is the master. I wouldn't say what's happening here is the work of the master. <laughs> Well, no, I'll give you that. But someone is controlling things, our every move. Yeah. Yes. Yes, shifting us around on a mental chessboard, ma manipulating us like hapless pawns. Hapless pawns. Ew. This is terrible dialogue. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's turgid. Yeah, but sometimes you don't know how a line is going to sound until you've said it out loud. Maybe it read better on paper? That sounds like something a writer would say. It does, doesn't it? And she was the one who decided we were riding on a train. I didn't decide anything. It was, I was just doing what you suggested. Me? 
You're the one who told me to imagine what I was seeing out there. The one telling me to focus. That's right. She did. Maybe you planted the idea in my head. That is nonsense. I was just trying to be helpful. You seemed lost, both of you. We were lost. Characters adrift without a plot. And then you climbed up here. Oh, please. If I were writing something, it certainly wouldn't be a, a cheesy murder mystery populated by a bunch of two-dimensional characters like you. How dare you? You take that back. How dare you? You take that back. How many times have you heard that something like that before? I promise you. If I were writing something, it might not be great, but it wouldn't have predictable lines you could see coming a mile away. I don't know. I don't think it sounded that bad. Well, well, well. What? A little defensive, are you? Somebody step on your creative toes? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, don't you? Wait, you don't think I've written this, do you? Up until a few minutes ago, I was sitting out there. I'm only up here by accident. By accident. And yet, you just kept coming back again and again. It is always the least likely suspect, after all. This was my favorite shirt. Look at what you've done to it. It's ruined. I didn't do that. She, she did that. Did I, Brian? Did I really? Or was I just following the stage directions you had written for me? No, no, I didn't write anything. I don't write anything, not even emails. And my texts are like two words long. Ask anybody. Have a seat, Brian. We need to talk. Mm -hmm. This, this is crazy. It isn't me, I tell you. The trouble with writers, Brian, is that they have a god complex. A what? They create whole worlds. And scenarios. And then they drop people down into the middle of them. People they've created. Given life to. Purpose. Desires. Beliefs. Dreams. Set them on some course of action. And that's good. Admirable. Even we all want to have some direction in life after all. But then. 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 Well, he loses focus. Well, the writer does, I mean. That's distracted. Goes out for a drink with friends. Or there's something good on TV. Or he has to go to his real job. Well, let's be honest here. I mean, people, you know, actually make a living writing plays. <laughs> Or maybe it's just good old-fashioned writer's block. He's stuck on a plot point. Doesn't know where to go from here. So he just stops. What's the harm after all? It's just a piece of fiction. Who really cares? Who's going to see this unfinished work? Gets shoved in a drawer someplace. But there's us. The characters he's birthed, breathed life into, stuck in the purgatory of an unfinished story. Oh, it's no skin off his nose. He's on to the next half-baked idea with a bunch of brand new characters who are likely to go into suffer the same fate. The same lack of fate, you mean? Mm -hmm. Doesn't he have a responsibility? A responsibility? If he gives us a beginning, then he should give us an ending, a resolution, any resolution. It doesn't have to be a happy one. It can be tragic. Look at Willie Loman, Hamlet. Medea had a gabler. Othello, Antigone. Or practically any character that Eugene O'Neill ever wrote. The point is, it's cruel to create a person and then just abandon them. Walk away without a look back. Don't we deserve to know our fate? Of course you do. I do. But I can't give it to you. I can't give it to myself because it's not me. I didn't create this. Oh, Brian. Write us an ending. That's all we're asking. Any ending, just something so that we can have a sense of closure and those people out there can go home. I wouldn't know where to begin. You don't have to. You've already done that. We just need to know where to go from here. 
please, Brian, try. Okay, but you'll see, nothing's going to happen. Okay. Brian gets up and goes home. No, still here, I told you. Oh, come on. You're not taking this seriously. How can anybody be expected to take this seriously? So you just want all of us to be stuck here like this forever, is that it? Is it? Rupert, well, if you don't need anything more from me, well, if you don't need anything more from me, <clears throat> I guess I'll be running along. I guess I'll be running along. And Rupert exits. I'll be damned. It's true. You are the author. Do me now. Uh, Iris crosses to the upstage window. Iris crosses up to the spot where Magenta was looking out earlier. Iris, look, the train has come to a station. Look, the train has come to a station. And the snow has stopped. I think I'll go and grab a breath of fresh air. Good evening, everybody. And the snow has stopped. I think I'll go and grab a fresh a, a breath of fresh air. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Brian. Iris exits. Last, we're finally getting somewhere. I'm so happy. Magenta. Oh, I'm so unhappy. I'm so. Wait, what? I'm so unhappy. Uh, I'm so unhappy. Sterling, unhappy? What do you mean, darling? I'm happy. What do you mean, darling? I can't keep up the charade any longer, Sterling. Charade? What do you mean? I don't love you anymore. I haven't loved you in a long time. A very long time. You, you don't know what you're saying. Ever since I found out about your affair with Taffy. Taffy? Who the hell is Taffy? You know very well who she is. Some chick you picked up at Olive Garden someplace. Don't insult my intelligence by playing dumb. I'm not playing. I mean, I don't know. I really don't. What, what kind of person goes by the name Taffy anyway? Nobody I want to hang out. At least have some decency to look at me in the eyes when you're lying to me, you cad. Magenta slaps Sterling. Hey! Oh, Sterling, I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. I do. Are you all right? Uh, I'm fine. Abruptly, a sultry temptress sweeps into the room. She's a sort of seductive vixen who leaves a trail of broken hearts and equally broken men wherever she goes. Iris bursts onto stage. She still wears the same outfit as before, but now sports bright red lips, mascara, and dark eyeliner. She strikes a seductive pose. Iris? No, I'm Taffy. But wait, what's happening here? Hold on. I'm Iris's identical sister. Oh, come on, really? I had an inspiration, just go with it. I'm here to tell you what he is too much of a coward to confess. Iris crosses to Sterling, clutches him by the shoulders and pulls his face to hers and kisses him passionately. After several seconds, she breaks the kiss and pushes him away. She turns to Magenta. There, now do you see? I, I, I not exactly. Oh, Magenta, you poor, beautiful, stupid fool. 
We've been carrying on right under your nose for months. Sterling, is this true? Of course not. It's it's all him. He's doing this. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. Sterling, yes, my dear, I'm afraid it is. Say it. Say it. Yes, my dear, I'm afraid it is. Yes, my dear, I'm afraid it is. I was only after your money. I was only after your money. Once we were married, I began shifting it bit by bit into a Swiss bank account. You're pen penniless now, I'm afraid. What? I am going to get you for this. Suddenly, the door bursts open. Magenta's father, plantation owner Jackson Fortescue Lee, stands on the threshold. Rupert enters wearing a bolo tie and a Panama-style straw hat, but otherwise dressed as he was before. Not so fast, you yellow billy scoundrel. Wait, we're Southern now? <laughs> Daddy! We thought you were dead, burnt to a crisp when that barn will restore the tobacco to dry. And then the barn caught on fire and you were trapped inside. Hmm. I wonder if it's really how they dry tobacco. I should probably double check. I'll do that later. Maybe. Uh, Jackson advances into the room. Yes, the door suddenly closed and locked behind me. I caught a whiff of kerosene just before I saw flames shoot up. In no time, I was nearly surrounded by a kind of, kind of, hold on, hold on. Conflagration? Is that what you're trying to type? Yeah, that's it. In no time, I was nearly surrounded by conf. Okay, how do you spell it? Oh my God. C O N. For God's sake, we're gonna be here. L. In no time, I was nearly surrounded by a wall of fire. What is it with you writers and your love of big words? Half these people probably don't know what the word conflagration means anyway. No offense, no offense, but you see my point, right? You should just type wall of fire and get on with it. Fine, wall of fire. <clears throat> but I dipped an old burlap bag in the water trough, threw it over my back, and dodged through the flames and escaped the barn just in time to see Sterling disappearing around the back of the veranda, carrying a jug of kerosene. No. Yes. You scoundrel of a husband tried to do me in. Sterling, how could you? I don't think I did. This is very disappointing. I'm not even sure I want to continue having an affair with you now. But wait, Daddy, didn't you just say the door was locked? How did you get out? Um, through a window? And if you didn't perish in that tobacco fire, where have you been this whole time? Why have you waited until now, after Sterling has robbed both of us blind, to return? Um, um, uh, <clears throat> amnesia? That's been done a thousand times already. How about this? With the burlap sack over his head, Jackson didn't see where he was going and fell into the well. And he only just now climbed out? What do you think? I don't know. I'd like to believe I'm smarter than that. But it's better than amnesia. That's true. Oh, that's it. I've had it. Get up. Get up. Get out of that seat and don't ever sit there again. Fell into the well and only just now climbed out and, and the rest of you were going to go along with that. Well, I didn't see you making any suggestions. Of course not. I was giving you all free reign, hoping you'd Come up with something, something better than this. And I was trying to give them a glimpse into what playwriting can be like. Wait, what do you mean? Yep, right in front of you the whole time. You 
You're the one behind this? You're the author? No, I, I don't believe it. You've been with me the entire time since the beginning. I would have known. Fine. Let's say I'm the personification of the playwright. Every author writes a part of him or herself into his work. I'm that. The way better looking part. The audience sees the story through my perspective because it's the most, it most closely matches his perspective. So our author is a philandering cad, an embezzler, and an attempted murderer. No, that's all thanks to you. To me? To all of you. The writer plots out his story thoroughly, intricately. He knows exactly where it's going, every little development that will happen along the way, and how it's all going to end up. Who will live, who will die, who will get what they want, and who will get what, what's coming to them occasionally. Okay, rarely, that's exactly how it plays out. More often, not. More often, he creates characters who begin to take on characteristics he'd never intended them to have. They become his, his willful little children, refusing to do things he tells them and doing other things he would never intended they should. We're willful little children. Sometimes it can be frustrating, but more often it's interesting. Now they've become real, so real that he's lost control. They drive his story in a direction he'd never intended, sometimes better ones. Not always, but sometimes. And so he has to take a chance. He has to see where they're taking him. Maybe they'll lead him to an amazing discovery. So how'd we do? You really have to ask. You were a noble experiment. Uh-oh. You just didn't go anywhere useful, however. It isn't your fault. I want you to know that. It's mine. I just didn't make any of you genuine enough. Genuine? So what happens now? I go back and try again. Maybe tackle things from a slightly different angle. Us? What about us? Honestly, I can't say for sure. What kind of father figure are you? What kind of parent tells his children they aren't genuine enough? I already explained that isn't your fault. You shouldn't feel badly. Bad. We shouldn't feel bad, not badly. Um, what? You're trying to use an adverb with a linking verb instead of an adjective. Saying we feel badly is implied that there's something wrong with our sense of touch. And you call yourself a writer? If there's anybody here who sh ought to feel bad or badly, it's you. That's right. Why should we pay for the price of your incompetence? Why should you arbitrarily write us out of existence just because you don't know what you're doing? No, try not to take any of this personally. You're all fine characters, and I'm, I might well use each one of you in, in something else one of these days. Oh, well, that is mighty big of you. Except, it's like you said a minute ago, you made us real. That's right. Yeah. So real that you have lost control. Isn't that what you said? They close in on Sterling. No, wait. You are willful little children and minds of their own. We're not going anywhere. And I can have a dog named Buster if I want to. Look, we're all just here to serve the story, right? We want what's best for the plot. Maybe what's best for the plot is if Sterling goes away. Uh, no, look, maybe I was being too impulsive before, uh, short-sighted, maybe. Uh, maybe if we collaborate together, we can figure a way out of this. All right, then lay it out for us. Just what is the story you're, that we're supposed to be serving here? I don't really know. But you're the writer, aren't you? The personification. I'm just the personification of him. The better looking, the better looking part. Yeah, we got that. 
But aren't you, aren't we forgetting something? What? Look. Them. Look at them. You keep talking about serving the plot, serving the story. But what about them? They bought tickets. They've given up their time to be here, to be entertained. What have we served them? What can we do about it at this point? We could refund their money. No. Uh uh. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Well, we need to do something. Okay, Brian, you were sitting out there with them before. What were you hoping for when you came when you came in here tonight? Um, I don't know. To be honest, I don't go to theater very much. Brian. <laughs> that figures. Well, what about you, Iris? You were out there too. What were your expectations? Well, it depends on the show. You know, sometimes I hope I'll feel inspired or moved or surprised. I always enjoy a good twist at the end. Uh, oh, a twist. Some kind of a twist. Okay. Hey, what about this? What if I what if it turned out that they aren't the audience? Rupert crosses upstage to retrieve his chair. He brings it downstage, faces the audience, and sits. What if we are? Uh, oh. oh, they all cross up, grab their chairs, bring them downstage and line them up in a row next to Rupert's. They sit, gazing expectantly out at the audience. This is very exciting. I wonder what we're going to see. I don't want to miss anything. Has everybody silenced their cell phones? I don't have one, remember? Or a dog. You shut up. Both of you shut up. The show is starting. 15 seconds or so pass. Nothing's happening. Maybe this is supposed to be a dramatic pause, you know, for effect. Maybe someone's forgotten their lines. A few more seconds pass. Now it's just getting awkward. You think anybody would notice if we got up and left? Another couple of seconds elapse. For nowadays, the world is lit by lightning. Blow out your candles, Laura. And so, goodbye. Iris blows out an invisible candle in front of her. What? The glass menagerie. Now that's an ending. Rupert stands and crosses behind the chairs, puts his hand on Iris's shoulder. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, Virginia Woolf, Virginia Woolf? I am George. I am. Magenta stands and crosses several steps away from the others. She's so young. There are so many things I meant to tell her and never got around to it. Iris stands, crosses behind Magenta, puts a hand on her shoulder. Let her learn them for herself, Flo. Sterling stands. So we beat on boats against the current born back ceaselessly into the past. Oh, you weak, beautiful people who give up with such grace. What you need is someone to take hold of you gently with love and hand your life back to you like something gold you let go of. I do love you, Brick. I do. Wouldn't it be funny if that were true? Magenta and Sterling exit. Yes, it's clearing up. There are the stars doing their old crisscross in the skies. Scholars haven't settled the matter yet, but they seem to think there are no living beings up there, just chalk or fire. Only this one is straining away, straining away all the time to make something of itself. To strain so great that every 16 hours, everybody lies down to get a rest. Mm. 11 o'clock in Grover's Corners. Everybody's resting in Grover's Corners. Tomorrow's going to be another day. You get a good rest, too. Good night. 
So many pretty endings. If you're going to steal, steal from the best. I don't know what the hell anybody is talking about. I'm sorry, mister, but you're just left out in the cold. Well, that's what happens to some people. Iris and Rupert turn away and exit. Wait, don't go. Don't leave me out here. Um, I'm sure they'll be back in a minute. After a few seconds of staring fixedly at the audience, Brian carefully aligns all of the chairs so they are in a neat row. He looks off stage, both left and right. Hello. He waits a few seconds. When no one answers, he crosses around and sits in the middle chair facing the audience once more. The only reason I even came out tonight was that somebody at work had a free ticket and couldn't make it. So they gave it to me. Or maybe that's just more of my backstory. I don't know anymore. The lights are beginning to fade. It takes Brian a few seconds to notice. Wait, what's happening? Oh, thank God. And the lights fade to black and end of play. Bring all the actors back. And you guys can talk for a few minutes and I will move to bring everyone else onto the stage with us. Hey, everybody. <laughs> nice job, guys. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Always such good work. <laughs> such good fun. Such good words. Or some of them. <laughs> layers and layers. Hello, Scott. Thank you guys so much. You were terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. I feel like it really put you through your paces and you, you came through with flying <laughs> colors. <laughs> <laughs> that was just such a clever <laughs> metadrama primer and homage to all these wonderful plays to rod <laughs> serling to agatha christie <laughs> it's just it was so much fun thank you thank, thank you, you to scott and all the great actors you guys did a great job uh, yeah Scott, I just got it, it. You know, it was like, okay, I thought I knew where this was going. And I'm speaking as a, <laughs> as a reader, one of the judges, when I was reading it, I thought I knew where it was going. It just kept on going. And it just like went where I didn't think it was going to go, which was <laughs> really great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone out there have any questions for Scott? And if you haven't figured out, that is our playwright, Scott Gibson. So hello and welcome, right? Mm -hmm. And bravo. Anyone Thank out you. there have any questions or comments or? It's not a talkative group today. <laughs> I think I've confounded everybody. They're not quite sure what happened. <laughs> so here's, here's one question that I have. I mean, I, sure. I just love all those plays that you bring in and endings. There's, you know, Gatsby's in there too, but how did you, I mean, I'm imagining as a writer that you had all these wonderful endings. How did you choose which lines you wanted to conclude your play with? Well, you're giving me more credit than I really deserve. <laughs> um, but at, when I knew where the story was going to end, um, I set it aside and I went searching through dozens and dozens and dozens of plays, not only plays that I thought had really good endings, but plays that most people would, would be familiar with. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even though 
other than mentioning having a magenta mention glass menagerie, none of the other plays actually get mentioned. So I wanted as many of them as possible to to be as obvious. Like mm -hmm. the, the easy cheat is, um, of course, the Grover's Corner thing from Thornton Wilder play Our Town. Most everybody knows that because most everybody had to read it in high school or has seen it somewhere in their lives. So uh, it was just a matter of, of culling as many really nice endings um, mm -hmm. to plays. Mm -hmm. I feel like the one that I really lucked on out of the blue was um, uh, the one from Bus Stop, which is, is the last one in the play where um, uh, he says, uh, where Rupert says something to the order of, well, I guess you're just out in the cold. And I just lucked on that one, but I went, oh, that's so perfect because Brian is kind of left out of the yeah, cold. He's yeah. stranded on the stage when everybody else is finally gone. So, um, so that's where that came from, yeah. And that's what, um, to me, what's interesting is, and you know, with all of us that have studied and read these and we're looking at a number of classics that are sitting in here and all the inside jokes, it really <laughs> is this, right? Yeah. This theater person's kind of, you know, inside joke to get all of them, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, has it been read before? No. Um, this is, is the first, well, I take, no, I take it back. There's actually a, a uh, local uh, play reading group in Evergreen, Colorado, where I live. And in fact, I see that one member from that play reading group, Kathleen Davis, is, is on this, uh, watch the show. Now, oh, to our Sally is there as well. Uh, so uh, I, I put it to them probably, I think it was last spring. Um, it was it was actually, it had to have been before COVID. It was probably right before COVID because we actually met in person uh, and <laughs> they read this. And I wow. think it uh, thoroughly confounded that group as well. So, but yeah, that's, that's the only, it was just an informal reading around a table and that was it. So, yeah. And I mean, what, you know, what feels to me, I mean, what's interesting is that there are jokes, you know, it plays on, on two levels. Mm -hmm. There are jokes that people won't get, but right. there are jokes <laughs> for them as well. So it's not like, you know, it's, you've, you've put it here where you might lose half an audience and it, you know, so the rhythm of playing for both of those resonates and that's, you know, that's what works well in the piece. Oh, good. I'm glad you saw that. Br Brian was sort of, the, the character, he had to be a, a non-theater character so that he was kind of the, the way in for a, a lot of audience members yeah. who wouldn't necessarily be familiar with things. So the other characters could explain stuff to Brian, mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of a, my cheat so that in, in case audience members didn't know, they didn't have to feel bad because Brian didn't know either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that he says somebody gave him a ticket at the last <laughs> minute. <laughs> it's like, you know what? That's who our audiences are in part. At least some of them are like that. Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah. yeah. So I, I have a, a, a question, Scott, about the layers and layers because, um, you know, there's the teacher, bad, not bad. Badly, not bad, right? There's the, <laughs> yeah. the characters, um, you know, I find Iris says a lot of that, this is terrible writing. So she's focusing on the writing. Um, it seemed like different characters had different through lines as far as what, what I'm not sure if I'm saying, like finding, finding the words to say this, but uh, more focused, like Magenta is an actress. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, Yes, Iris is definitely the, the most intelligent of the characters, and she's the one who's able, <laughs> and, and it came through beautifully in your performance. Thank you. uh, she's the one who, who's the most rational, the one who can kind of look beyond what's happening in the moment. And uh, so, again, I guess she's, she's a little like uh, Brian in that she's, she, she can move the story along when with the other characters, even Sterling, who wrote it um, can't move it along. She can kind of, you know, try to get it back on track. Yeah. Yeah. There are some lovely comments in there. I don't know if you saw them, Scott. Oh no. You see in the chat. Yep. 
Oh, I see there's, yeah, okay. Oh, how nice. <laughs> <laughs> I am a bit confounded, yeah. <laughs> um, I, will, I will share a behind the scenes thing uh, in that uh, my motivation for writing it was, in fact, it was in the introduction, it was said, you know, that I have all of these plays that have never seen the light of day. And the, the initial germ of the idea was, I do feel guilty about the plays that are sitting in drawers and places that have <laughs> never been finished and thinking, are, are these characters really trapped in a kind of purgatory because I've never gotten around to completing their story. So that was the motivation going into this that, you know, these, these, it was my way of, of saying to all of those characters in all of those plays, I feel your pain. Um, I didn't <laughs> intend to leave you hanging high and dry uh, with writer's block. I just, I, I don't know what to do with you, but don't think that I don't think about you and I don't feel guilty about you because I do. So that was, that was <laughs> what was in my mind when I sat down at the, the top of page one. All those mm. blundering characters. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and the five actors were wonderful. You you just you embodied you know everything that needed to be there. The the, the cynicism of uh, Rupert and the uh, flamboyance and over the top of Magenta and Sterling sort of shifting from uh, seeming to be like Magenta to turning out to be nothing like Magenta at all and. Iris and Brian, it was, it, I didn't really know when I started that they were going to begin as audience members who were going to wind up back up on stage. Um, but as soon as as that happened, I knew exactly where they were going to go. And with all five characters, uh, they really just sort of dictated their lines, their motivation to me. I just felt like all I had to do was sit back and just it, it's like the, the sequence where Brian is sitting there typing away. That's what I felt like in reverse, in that I didn't have to come up with anything. The characters were all talking to me as fast as they could, and it was all I could do to capture what they were saying on the page. So thank you to all of you for, for bringing it to life. I do have a question I, I uh, from Sally. I love the guesswork. Which character is really the author? <laughs> Where can this possibly go? How can it possibly end? And yes. <laughs> And then a kudos to the cast, too. Yes. And Sally, there were a few moments in there when I was thinking that, where can this possibly go? How am I going to wrap this up? So, yeah, a lot of what um, Sterling says are, are things that I really do think, you know, um, you guys, you characters were a noble experiment, um, but you didn't work out for me. And, and I'm sorry, it's not your fault. It's my fault kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'm unmuting. Um, I, I wanted to say that um, I really liked the there's a very there's a there's a very soulful feeling at the very end of the play when it's Brian by himself on stage. Um, it is, there's a lot of pathos there, um, which is to me is a different, it, it, it sort of brings the, the energy and the different feelings that we get from the characters from the beginning. And then it just brings it to this very tender ending in a way. It's like, and then the lights are fading down on this person and right, it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they're fading down on him right when he gets it. Yeah. That's, yes, you're you know, exactly I love right. That. Yeah, I love that a lot, so. Thank you very much, yeah. <laughs> And I, I, I think you're exactly right. That word tender just really epitomizes that ending, which is such a surprise after it, it it's a surprise, but it feels authentic. Good. Um, and I, I really like the way you just suddenly shift it. Thank you. I'm really honored that you guys that, you know, it, it was one of the three that you selected. I just, I, couldn't believe my good fortune. So thank you very much. Congratulations say. and thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yours was an easy choice, actually. Oh, wow. That's nice to hear. Anything else? Thank you so much. All right, everyone out there, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And this concludes the 2021.
play reading series um, for the for the season in 21-22. We hope that we'll be live and we'll be talking to Scott and some of our <laughs> other authors when we hope to be in person on a stage again where we can take it to the next level of reading and um, and celebrate these plays again. And it's hard to believe that our 25th season is this close to ending, okay? Um, and then 26, and if Joe is out there, as we keep saying, doesn't it, does anybody want a theater company? Does anyone want a festival? <laughs> Anyhow, as we, as we age, we need to age out, put some youngsters in here, right? <laughs> All right. There's a big thank you. Um, I think, uh, was there something new in there? A little congratulations all. And that's it. It's a wrap, guys. Thank you so much. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> Have a great night. Enjoy the rest of the fest. Yeah. It still says we're live, but we're not. Okay. <laughs> okay, Tootsie. Coffee it's or still- nap? Food. What? Coffee, food. Ew, old time radio is at eight <laughs> o'clock. I gotta go check and see how Shannon's doing. I think I think the dance challenge has gone off. And um, yep, I gotta gear up for OTR at eight. Okay. All right, I will talk food, to you. Something. Okay, bye, love you. Okay. Love you. Love bye. Ya. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>